Hello everyone and welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I know this is not the intro you expected, but we have a big announcement to make. The Six Pack team has put together our first swag campaign. It includes t-shirts, v-neck shirts, uh, hoodies, and stickers, all of which you can buy during this limited time campaign. Very limited time. You can get these uh, these shirts with Six Pack Philosopher on the front and our logo on the back. Uh, but, but again, it's limited time. This only goes through November 4th. So if you want this, you need to get out there and purchase now. And you're going to find them at Teespring. Uh, the URL that you need to look for is teespring.com slash sixpackphilosopher. That's what it says on the shirt. So that's what our URL is going to be, teespring.com slash sixpackphilosopher. Now that we've made this little plug, you can enjoy the show. What do you get when you mix one part philosophy one part politics and cut it with a healthy shot of history you get the perfect podcast cocktail thank you for listening now sit back open your drinks and open your minds this is six pack philosophy Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy with Mike and John. I'm Anastasia, and this week we are discussing the office of the president and whether or not it really matters who is actually holding that office. Um, but before we get started, what are we drinking, gentlemen? We are drinking Breakside Pilsner. From the Breakside Brewing Company in Portland, Oregon. This is a 5.2 ABV. And another one of our Oregon series from Bria. So thank you, Bria, again. Uh, we got this one and one more, and then you guys can stop hearing about Bria. Unless you want to send us more beer, in which case <laughs> we will totally hear more about Bria. I don't think we're ever going to stop hearing about Bria. We're, st we're still planning a statue uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, of some sort. Uh, it's going to be Picasso style, not because I actually admire his work, although I do, but because I'm completely incapable of doing anything that actually represents a human body. I just thought we would take all the, all the bottles and we would like form them into a body. Oh, I like that. That would be like perfect, wouldn't oh, it? We talked about this once. Yeah, yeah that would be we? awesome. That would be awesome. I once went to an art exhibit where they the whole thing was the guy anthropomorphized anthropomorphized bottles. Like he gave them little arms and legs and put them in just different situations. There was bottles sitting at a strip club with a bottle and a strip pole. There was bottles <clears throat> sitting at home having a conversation. Just all these bottles that I gave little arms and legs to and made the bottles little scenes of people. So, Bria, now you know what to expect. Um, it's a really cool exhibit. So exactly, exactly what are we doing today now? Um, so, like, Trump and all. What was that? Trump and all. What? You just, like, in the middle of your sentence, just, like, made a little musical instrument out of your bottle. <laughs> There's a little toot in the middle. It, 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 was, it was remotely sexual, I'm just saying. Yeah. If you had been here to see what she was doing... <laughs> it was going to dribble, and I didn't want to make a mess. Um, yeah. Well, that, that, all right. That's not getting you, you, better. You've got that, right? Yeah. Uh, you got that, yeah, right? Got okay. It. So anyway, Trump and all. Um, like, there have been people who, first of all, like, prior to the election on both sides, were saying, like, if Hillary gets elected, then... America is going to crash into the ground and cease to exist. And they were saying the same, the other people were saying the same thing about if Trump got elected. And it turns out they were both right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we can't crash in the ground. We're already on the ground. Well, you know, I mean, it's a whole thing. But um, this whole idea that, like, who we put into the office of president has, is so incredibly important um, as if they have this insane amount of power to actually determine whether or not this, um, country exists. Um, and, and so we kind of wanted to have a discussion about, um, whether or not that's really the case, um, that, you know, does just how much trouble they can cause. That does the president even matter? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So... I think we were going to jump to you, Mike, for a little historical context. Yeah, let, let, let's talk a little bit about what the what the president's powers actually are. Um, and and the fact is, the the president the president's powers are greatly limited. 
mm -hmm. greatly limited. And, and that was done intentionally. We intentionally invent, uh, created a system of divided government. Uh, you know, we, we took Baron de Montesquieu's idea of separation of power with this mm -hmm. idea of a, an executive, legislative, and judicial branch, and we put it on steroids, uh, yeah. which, which basically means it's that— It's a very American thing to do. Absolutely. We made the legislative branch excessively powerful, yeah. and then we made the uh, executive branch uh, incredibly weak intentionally. Yeah. And it makes sense if you think about it because think about what they were— uh, you know, what the, the rebellion had been against. It had been right. against a tyrannical government, a largely a tyrannical uh, a king. Yeah. Although I would argue that the, that the parliament was every bit as tyrannical at that time period. So we come through with this, <coughs> excuse me, this idea of a president that cannot act unilaterally. Right. The president only has executive powers. And I want to talk a little bit about those, uh, those specific executive powers. Uh, the president has a military power, mm -hmm. which you know you you hear in these in these campaigns all the time that you know the the president's going to exercise this great military power, but constitutionally the president's military power is incredibly limited. Yeah, the uh, uh, only the legislative branch has the power to to declare war. Uh, so so at least if you look at the formal powers, the president does not have the authority to to send troops into into battle. However, we have what's called implied powers, and the fact that the president's commander-in-chief means that there's an implied power there that's understood that uh, in, in the case of, of extreme emergencies – and this is what the founders would have, would have thought of – extreme emergencies. We're attacked and Congress isn't in session. The president can, can send the troops out. Uh, this has been, been greatly, greatly abused. Uh, John, when was the last time – can, can you just name a couple of instances where where the president has has sent troops into uh, into battle without declaring war? Yeah, Desert Storm, um, Desert Shield, um, Bay of Pigs, uh, Granada, Granada. Uh, Panama. Yeah, uh, basically every. I was going to say I thought you said a couple. Like, <laughs> are we just going to list them all? Any, there's a lot. If you know a deployed soldier right now, and he's not sitting at base. <laughs> That's an example. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, so so the president's power is is greatly limited uh, legally, but because of the implied power, he, he's able to get around that. Now, yeah. now we tried to fix that. We tried to fix that in the 1960s with the War Powers Act, mm -hmm. and the War Powers Act. If, if you're not familiar, uh, it was it was actually passed to try and restrain. Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. And the idea was the president could only send troops in, out for 60 days without then getting a declaration of war from, from Congress without, or, or without getting approval from Congress, not even a declaration of war. That sounds like it would greatly limit a president. But in fact, no president has ever had it denied by, uh, by, uh, by Congress whenever yeah. they, they brought that 60 days to them. Never, not one time have they denied the president the ability to, to leave troops out there. So – you know that would Why that would be not? a be a pretty powerful thing. Um, the other thing that that amazes me about presidents is they they tend to think that they have the, the, this ability to to lead people. That uh, you know, partly because that they've just won this massive election. You know, right. uh, a lot mm -hmm. of times a lot of times in a landslide election, and they think that since I was selected by all the people, I now have this mandate to to push my my agenda through. Um, but we know that at least since World War II, Americans have overwhelmingly chosen divided government. Yeah. Overwhelmingly, we have chosen to have a president of one party and a Congress of another. Mm -hmm. In which case, we see that, uh, that that president's powers are incredibly limited. And we've seen very few cases where, where presidents have been able to push their legislative agenda. Very, very few cases. I can think of a handful off the top of my head uh, – uh, Obamacare, uh, yeah. the Affordable Care Act was pushed by the president. Uh, you know, so you've got cases like that. The Patriot Act was pushed by by George Bush, right. but that right. was in the event of a of an extreme emergency. Uh, but it, it's 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 pretty pretty rare for it to happen. Yeah, Most well, of and the that, time, the Patriot Act would have passed. I think regardless of how divided it would have been, just given what happened at the time. Well, and at that time, but Bush didn't have divided. When the Patriot Act went yeah. through, he he had control of Congress. Yeah. So it was something a little bit different. Uh, Obama managed to get Obamacare through without, you know, with divided government. Mm -hmm. you know, he he did not control both houses when that went through. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. We'll, so we'll talk about that another day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, ha- and, and the Supreme court, let's not forget, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. How about the Thanks, judicial Robert. power? The judicial power there. Um, mm-hmm. The president has, has has really very little in the way of judicial power. Uh, they have the pardon of part power of pardons and reprieves, mm-hmm. which you know is, is not used a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. When it is used, it's usually incredibly controversial, uh, and almost always used in the last days of a presidency before they before they get out, they'll pardon somebody. Is the use rising? Because I, I know that Obama went on a little bit of a pardoning spree there at the end on a Didn't political Clinton agenda. Too? Yeah, Clinton yeah. did too there at the very end. Uh, uh, I'm not actually sure if if Reagan Bush did. did or not. I can't think of Bush. I know Reagan Reagan pardoned several people that were involved in the Iran Contra scandal. Well, I think he kind of started the modern era. And now Trump is 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 on some new levels like already. Yeah. Uh, and you had the most interesting pardon of all time to me was uh, what was the pardon that wasn't a pardon? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, when when Gerald Ford uh, went ahead and pardoned Richard Nixon oh, of yeah. any crimes he may or may not have been uh, yeah. committed before he the was, just in case of pardon, yeah, yeah, the just in case pardon. Uh, so that that can be powerful, but it but it's, it's really not been used a whole lot. Where the president's judicial power comes in is his power to appoint judges. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, would y'all think that would be a really strong power? Um, you know, <laughs> you you want to get her? You go wanna, ahead. Okay, I was admiring the the awkward silence. Yeah, I, I think I, th- I think it should be a really strong power, but I feel like presidents, for one reason or another, have been completely inept at predicting how their appointees are going to act once they're appointed. That's that's the problem with with judicial appointments. Mm-hmm. Unlike other appointments, unlike cabinet appointments where the president can appoint and remove. Yeah. A judge is appointed for life. There uh, federal judges are they're, they're there for life or good behavior. So you look at the, these situations where you where you appoint somebody, they no longer have any accountability to that president. Yeah. yeah. So frequently you have people that that have acted very conservative throughout their career. And then they get to a federal judgeship, and you start to see that see that see this stuff change, particularly on the Supreme Court. Yeah, we've seen case after case after case where uh, where appointees have have uh, have not voted the way the president wanted to. Right. I think of uh, you know Roberts, Chief Justice yep. of the Supreme Court, appointed by Bush, and then he sided with the Affordable Care Act and surprised everybody. Fake um, right, go left. They <laughs> right, go left. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you know that that's not a power that 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 we would. Uh, you know, we would consider it to be a strong power. Are, are you dying over there? Fuck you, John. <laughs> He's also the chief diplomat. That's one of those enumerated powers in there, there for the president. Uh, it's been really interesting this year. Yeah, the chief diplomat. Well, what do you think that role is? I'm, I'm just curious. D- uh, doesn't he operate the White House Twitter account <laughs> and make cool little names for the other diplomats around the world? Oh my God! John. He really doesn't have a lot of power here. Uh, his, his power is to appoint diplomats, which is you know a, a, a big one. Yeah. That's but that's you know that's largely used as a uh, kind of a spoils system thing, as a mm-hmm. reward for somebody uh, or a, a place to groom somebody for a bigger position. Right. We're going to appoint you to a, to a diplomat to an important country, and then you can come back and run for Congress and use mm-hmm. this as your uh, as you know. As yeah. Your look at all the great shit I did. Uh, but the one that surprises me that, that, that we forget about is the president has the has the power to receive ambassadors. Mm-hmm. Now, this might not sound like a big deal. Uh, you know, so what? You get to receive ambassadors. But this also means that that you, you get to not receive ambassadors. You get to deny them. Yeah. In which case, uh, as once the president has, has received an ambassador, he has basically recognized that as a legitimate state. Mm-hmm. And there have been a lot of cases where this has been controversial. I think back to uh, President Eisenhower receiving the the, uh, ambassador from Israel. Mm -hmm. Boy, he pissed off the Palestinians at that point. They didn't recognize it as as a legitimate government. Or, uh, you know, there's been a lot of cases. Uh, uh, Bush recognized receiving Karzai. Yeah. Uh, That surprised everybody. So Calling the Taiwanese president. Yeah, calling the Taiwanese yeah. president, referring... Which ref- was before, Good on him for that. Yeah. Which well, was, I don't know that he realized what he was doing, but... Which was before he was actually in office. He had won the yeah, election. Yeah, yeah, he was the president-elect yeah, president 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 at the time. Yeah, at the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's something a little bit different. And the last of his, uh, uh, his, his diplomatic powers is the State of the Union. 
Uh, the State of the Union Which we is... get daily in 140 characters or less. <laughs> we do, we do. Uh, State of the Union is is constitutionally called for. Now, what I find interesting is we're sitting here laughing about the the idea of, of the, this, this twi- Twitter storm that mm-hmm. we get from Trump. But that is probably actually closer to the idea that the founders had about the State of the Union than what we've had. I, I can just imagine. A, a, as scary as it is, uh, George Washington, as first president, did address the Congress. Mm-hmm. But then Congress was not addressed again publicly with the State of the Union uh, uh, you know, before Congress until Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. Every president from, from Adams all the way up through uh, Woodrow Wilson just sent a letter to Congress yeah, that's what saying I thought. what it was. The State of the Union is something that is required, but they don't say how it has to be done. Could we possibly have a president here that's putting his State of the Union out in a, in a Twitter storm now? You know, you know I, that would be legal. I, it would be. Well, but it, th- there's also a really interesting argument that maybe we need to, to do a separate show or a hard shot on about whether his Twitter feed is an official document. Uh, you know, There's actually a, a, a case going to the, to the yeah. court over that. I really thought we'd done that one. Uh, uh, the, well, it hasn't, it hasn't been heard yet. There's a, oh. there's, there's a case that's going on. Oh, up. no, I, I thought we had done the show on that. Oh, no, we may we have. I know we talked it, about no, it. But oh, okay. I don't think we, uh, anyway. All right, so how about legislative powers? We've already talked about his ability to use the bully pulpit to try and push legislation through. Uh, Very ineffective. Very, very Mm -hmm. ineffective. Uh, In most cases, we've had some presidents that were good at it. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt comes to mind, was great at pushing the bully pulpit through. He was able to to get the national park system through Mm -hmm. that way. Uh, uh, Richard Nixon was not so great at it, except in one case, he got the Environmental Protection Agency to Mm -hmm. come out. Uh, Obama was probably the best at it uh, of anybody. Uh, Clinton was really good at it in his first term, really bad in his second. Uh, so you start you start seeing this stuff. But where the president has a lot of legislative power is in the power of veto, mm-hmm. uh, which they use surprisingly little. It's been used. I say surprising. It's been used very very little. Uh, but but if you look at it over over time. Uh, it, it's definitely grown. Mm-hmm. It's definitely grown. Uh, you know, you know, you start looking at uh, historically, presidents used it almost none. Yeah. Uh, I think about the big veto presidents. Andrew Jackson was a big one. Theodore Roosevelt was a big one. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you get back there. Franklin Roosevelt, of course, was the biggest one mm-hmm. of all. With, uh, of course, he served four terms. Yeah. Uh, you know, then you get up there and you know Reagan used it a little bit, uh, but. Obama surprisingly used it uh, more than than others had in a while, uh, and I I think I think we're about to see Trump be the new veto president. I mm-hmm. I would suspect I, I could be wrong. So. Uh, at least if you if you take him at his word, he uh, he he intends to be be this new veto president. Yeah, if uh, you take him at his word, then Hillary's in a in Auschwitz right now. <laughs> Auschwitz. I, I don't Auschwitz. think you're talking about Auschwitz. I don't, I don't think you can put him in, in, in Auschwitz. Uh, I don't think you can put I think her that's in a jail. museum right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now I want to talk about. Although the, she is old enough. Yeah. Ooh, that was mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Uh, she does look like the crypt keeper. All right. So I want to talk about the executive orders a little bit. This yeah. is this is the one that just 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 tears me up. It drives me crazy. Is the idea of an executive order. Uh, they are constitutionally allowed. You, mm-hmm. you can make an executive order. But if you read the text, the wording of the Constitution, an executive order is supposed to be an order given like a CEO to his uh, uh, Yeah, the legislature says do this, and, and the executive order says do how to do it. But that's not how it's been used. Uh, yeah, it's an instruction manual are supposed to be. The, yeah, yeah the, executive, the executive orders are something that, that has been – uh, abused a lot. Mm-hmm. Probably the most famous example, you know, Executive Order ninety sixty six, FDR's order to intern Japanese. Yeah. Uh, but but we've we've done this a lot, and we've seen it happen more and more in recent years. Uh, uh, Bush used it a little bit. Clinton used it a lot. Obama used it quite a bit. And it looks like and Trump's at least started his term uh, with, with with several high profile executive yeah. orders. So you're starting to see see a lot, but of a lot stuff. of them were really. I, I felt a lot of the early ones were close to what the Constitution was calling for. I, I mean, he really has yeah, done. Some I, yeah, I, they I, were I, controversial well, in their nature. Again, I don't think the problem was with what he did. I think the problem was with sometimes how he did it, uh, and, and you know. 
the executive orders I, – I am not a fan of executive orders. I, I think executive orders are, are a way around the Constitution. Mm-hmm. Well, and, uh, now, I can't say that because they're in the Constitution. But, well, well but, but, but let's look at some of them. His executive order on Obamacare. He gave an executive mm-hmm. order. He said, we are going to continue to follow the law, but I want the departments to start exploring ways we can do away with the law. To me, that is – a proper executive order. Well, how about how about when he clo- gave the executive order to close? Uh, um, uh, oh, my re- refuge cities. Uh, my brain shut off. Sanctuary. Sanctuary cities. cities. Now they've ignored him, but he he, he made an order to close sanctuary cities and, and, and to cut off funding to them. So yeah, you know, yeah that's true. I, you know that, that that's that's a good point. You wonder about those kind of things, which yeah. is which is another power. And I, I want to get into the implied powers a little bit. Uh, and, and since we were on that, I'll go ahead and talk about this one that is is the most underused one ever. Uh, it was threatened a lot by Obama and, and was never done. It's been threatened a lot by Trump, but hasn't been done yet. And that's the power of impoundment. The, oh, yeah. The president has the power to impound funds. So if Congress goes through and, and passes a law, uh, says, says, I want this done, the president can impound the funds and not finance that. What do you all think about that? I don't know. I don't know. Because on the one hand, you want to say, well, if Congress wants this done, you need to do it. On the other hand, you, you don't want to compel them to spend all the funds. I mean, if Congress says, here's $100,000 to go, you know, I don't know, build a wall around the White House and you can get it done for $75,000, you know, leave the 25000 there. It's fine. Yeah, which I you think know. is what the what the founders intended with the yeah, impoundment. Yeah. But what we've seen happen is uh, – I think of I think it was George W. Bush uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, Congress passed the, uh, the the legislation allowing stem cell research yeah and George W. Bush impounded the fund all of them mm-hmm. gave no funding to it yeah uh, uh, Reagan did the same thing with the uh, um, uh, arts uh, oh I can't think endowment. of what it is. Endowment. National Endowment of the Arts. Yeah. That one. He, he impounded all funds. Yes, Congress Congress uh, granted this and said you could do it. He impounded the funds and bankrupted them. Yeah. Uh, uh, Andrew Jackson did it with the Bank of the United States. Mm-hmm. He impounded all the funds and bankrupted the bank uh, b- because he thought it was an unconstitutional thing. It's a way of, of, it's a way of uh, getting around the legislative process. Yeah. Uh, and if a president uses that, that's very close to a dictatorial power. Yeah, yeah, it very, is. Very, very close to it. It is. Uh, but it hasn't been used a whole lot. I want to talk a little bit about executive agreements here. Uh, we've talked about executive orders. Anybody know what an executive agreement is? Uh, we've been through a lot of them. In fact, they're used a lot right now. Uh, an executive agreement is a treaty that doesn't go through the Senate, basically. Right. Oh, it's yeah. It's where the president that. goes through and, and the president or his, you know, his officers uh, – meet with another country, and they enter into an agreement with them. The advantage to an executive agreement is that it only requires a majority vote in both houses. Mm-hmm. A treaty has to have a two-thirds majority vote in the Senate. And very, very rarely does a president have enough votes to get to, uh, to push treaties through the Senate. Mm-hmm. So instead, we have these executive agreements. Think about some of the famous ones, uh, NAFTA, uh, GATT. Uh, th- these are massive executive agreements. Uh, uh, the Paris Protocols. Uh, yeah. All of these things were done by executive agreements. Now, here's the problem with it: it can be it can be undone by the next president. Yeah. But, well, and but you know another advantage of it, we, we have a few treaties that you know we actually get ourselves in trouble with because the way the Constitution is structured, a treaty that gets all the way through and gets signed is on the same level as the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. It it it, ha- it carries the full weight of the Constitution. So yeah. if we have a treaty that says that you know, unless we- it happens to be a treaty with Indians about what about the land they live on. Uh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you know, that's a good point. Yeah, we more or less violated the Constitution yeah. when yeah. we had a treaty of that level. And you know, the, the 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 a lot of the treaties don't get revoked; they just sit there forever. So yeah. if we have. If if we have a treaty uh, declaring internal peace with the Ottoman Empire, uh, or, or the Muslims, yeah, then you know we, we got to ask later. Their descendants come through. Yeah, they, they they come under a new flag. Does that treaty apply? I mean, we get into some we really ran, weird. We ran into that when the Soviet Union collapsed. If you yeah. if you y'all are y'all are y'all are young and might not remember all this, but uh, there was a big controversy when uh, when George W. Bush pulled us out of the uh, the uh, 
uh, nuclear arms treaty that we'd had with the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were all, well, we're so much more dangerous now. You pulled out of this treaty. And his argument was, I didn't pull out of a treaty with anybody. The country doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. He pulled out of this, he ended this treaty and entered into a new one with Russia. Yeah. You know, uh, but, you know, it, it, it looked to people like, like you know, you're, you're pissing on the, on the world and getting rid of this treaty. Yeah. Uh, but, but that was it. We had this, this long standing treaty with a nation that didn't even exist anymore. Yeah. And we were, you know, we were stuck with it. Yeah. So we've kind of looked at all of these, these, these powers here mm-hmm. and we've seen, uh, seen this. And, and the last thing I want to talk about before I throw it over to y'all and kind of, uh, uh, talk about do we think this stuff matters is the fact that America, uh, the American people are, uh, inherently uh, middle of the road conservative voters. But now, now when I say conservative, I'm not saying right or left. What I'm saying is, like, on don't the, change shit. On the political spectrum, we oh. tend to be right in the middle. Uh, th- there's not a big difference between your Republican and your Democrat voters if you look on the vast political spectrum. The world political, yeah, spectrum. the world political spectrum. We we tend to vote right in the middle. We are we are also inherently dualistic. Our system is built around a two party system. Now, it's not constitutional. At mm-hmm. all. There is nothing constitutional about a two-party system. But the way our votes are cast, the way the electoral college works, the way, uh, the way the whole system has been built, it is very hard to have anything but a, but a, but a strong two-party system. And that means that, that, that we have divided power a lot. Yeah. We have divided power a whole lot. And almost always the president is forced to work you know, uh, with a, with a, a government that is that, with that the is, other party. That is the of the other party. Yeah. yeah. And with a court system that has been appointed by his predecessors. Yeah. yeah. So w- knowing all that, does the president does the president matter? Does who is the president matter? Well, so but- before we get into that, um, we we've talked for about twenty five minutes on the powers of the executive mm-hmm. office, and I just saw the saddest thing. I got to tell you guys about it. <laughs> Anas- it, was, it was very sad. I have, I have a tear in my eye now. Yeah. Anastasia took the last gulp of her beer. And then stared at her glass perplexed like someone else had stolen it from her. Like, well, how did this happen to me? <laughs> anyway. I, I just, I was, it was gone. And <laughs> I realized there was no more. You realize you're talking about a lost loved one right here. It's like, I, I got up and, it, and he wasn't there. And uh, yeah. so, okay. I knew I'd never see it again. <laughs> So, so we wouldn't have that moment together. Spoiler alert: this beer is going to get a really good rating because it was incredibly easy to drink <laughs> and really good. I liked it. I think she should probably start. Yeah, I, I was going to say we normally do our Patreon thing and all that. Yeah. If you just want to go right into it, I was going to ask to start, but if you want to start, <laughs> you know, it'll be fresher on your palate. You know, yeah. yeah. This is the Breakside Pilsner from the Breakside Brewing Company in Portland, Oregon. I'm not sure if these tears are from laughing or the <laughs> sadness that this beer is gone. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but for real. So um, I, I've been sipping on this beer throughout the show, and it is incredibly easy to drink. Um, it's it's got a it's got both a lemon and a lemon peel flavor to it that are really good um, with a kind of a weedy base um weedy almost in the sense of a hefeweizen um but then it doesn't have that that banana that's uh characteristic of a hefeweizen um it's it's it would be a killer beach beer um but it does still have enough body that you know as we're sitting here in fall um it's still really enjoyable to drink um I'm I'm going to give this a 3.5. Um I think this is probably um as far as a pilsner goes, I think this is probably the best pilsner that we've had on the show. Um 3.5? Yeah. Um well, I think you have to consider the fact John, that was a 3.5. That was a 3.5. Okay. I think you have to consider the fact that a pilsner is generally going to be a lighter beer. Um yeah, Fair enough. Yeah. Um the the beers that do better on this show are typically the more full body <laughs> beers, um, the kind of the really rich beers, um, and that's not what this is supposed to be, and it's not what it is. Um, it is really enjoyable to drink, though, um, and I think it's it I think it's made really well. All right, so I'll I'll go ahead and follow that. Uh, you will luck. never you will never see more controversy on this show <laughs> than when it comes to beer time. Um, uh, 
so a couple things if you don't like it i'll finish it for you so a couple things um you know i guess i guess first i want to give a disclaimer that you know what me and the mistress have been sick for a while and i was i was a little worried my sickness may be affecting my rating of course now i'm worried that the mistress's sickness is affecting her rating so <laughs> no so there's that or, or um, mental illness hey. yeah you know i, I think it's a different show i think this bottle really well <laughs> describes this beer it's crisp refreshing and floral um and you know we, we when I talk about beers, I end up talking about dates a lot, you know, so I'm, I'm going to kind of describe this beer with a date. If you've been out there in the date space for a while, I'm sure you've all had this experience. That date, that was exactly what they said it would be. They said, okay, here's the deal. We're going to go to the movies and we're going to get a bite to eat and then that'll be the end of it. And you went to the movies, you watched the movie, you didn't, you didn't go to hold your hand or anything, just you watched the movie, you went to get something to eat, you went to a nice pizza joint, you enjoyed a pizza and he took you home, didn't even go, get, go in for the kiss. Perfectly mediocre, John. That, perfectly mediocre. That is this beer to a T. I, I mean... Then how is it that you're not in love with this beer? I never fell in love with mediocre I, people. I thought John was the master of mediocrity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I am. I, I'm not a, a, oh God, what was the Greek God that fell in love with himself when he saw himself in the mirror? Oh, fucking dicks. My brain is shut off. Anyway. I don't remember. Oh my God. Oh yeah, it's going to hurt us all for a while. Anyway. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It, it's Sis comp No, not Sisyphus. That's a different one. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, anyway. anyway. So, point is, um, this... This beer is a Pilsner. If you like Pilsner, this beer will be a beer that will be familiar to you. Uh, there is nothing special. <laughs> Narcissus. Narcissus, yes, of course. Uh, there's nothing special. It is a Pilsner. Um, and for that, I'm giving it a two. A oh, my two. God. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to steal a, a, a little bit from you, John, because yeah. you said that you thought this, uh, this, this bottle perfectly... Uh, uh, describe the beer and and I also think this bottle perfectly describes the beer because it's plain yeah. and it's simple and yep. I think that's what we have here uh I, I I don't think it's a bad thing but it it is it is a pilsner uh and and honestly I don't mind a pilsner it, right. it, you know right. I, it, it's not a beer that I that I mind drinking mm -hmm. it's not my favorite but this beer would be great on a on a hot day uh mm -hmm. it's easy to drink uh partly because it's so thin there is a little bit of a um, of a citrus in there. Mm. I, I don't know what it is. A little bit of uh, the, the way you described one earlier. It's more of an orange peel than an orange. You know, there's something mm -hmm. back there that that I can that I can taste, and and I like it. It's it's good. It's it's real simple, but it's not my beer. It's not what I want to drink mm -hmm. all the time. I think it does Pilsner well. I don't think it mm -hmm. does anything great. So uh, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm. I, I'm gonna call it a two five. I'm gonna call it. A, I'm gonna call it an average pilsner. I'm just saying, if you drink this and this is your favorite beer, uh, might I recommend water? That might be a great drink yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, mayonnaise <laughs> might be a little too spicy for you, but missionary <laughs> sex is gonna be great. Uh, just, you just, just made a a drink, food, and sex recommendation based yes. on this beer, which is yeah. perfect. Which is okay. perfect. Okay. Okay. All right. So, what date beer, John? Uh. I don't know. Uh, I'm. You know what? I'm not trying to impress anyone with this. You know what this is? This is the last thing. This is when you're going to let her know that this isn't yeah. working out. Okay. All this right. has been very plain. We're not going anywhere. And it, you know, it's just okay. And I, I'm, I'm going to call it a lawnmower beer. Yeah, I think it's sure. a good lawnmower beer. Uh, I think it's an intro to craft beer. I really think it is. I think this is the beer you give somebody that doesn't like craft beer. This is a beer you give somebody that likes, you know, uh. Plain average beer. You, you know what this would be good for, seriously? Um, if you were taking the, uh, the, and, and I don't know, the, uh, the beer aficionados out there may disagree with me, but I think if you were taking the, the, the test you gotta take to be a beer, like a, a rater of beer, like this would be your stock pilsner like this is the yeah the standard for what a pilsner yeah i think, I think it is it the epitome pilsner of a pilsner well. it does pilsner well yeah uh which is which is why i give it a two five uh so you know we were kind of we were all, all over, over the, the fucking two, place two two five and like <laughs> and the three like, five like seven nine over it's the like yeah. seasonable yeah. rating for this beer and then uh, two fucking wag jobs over here uh yeah all right well all right i i, I thought we were rating how good the beer was not shaquille o'neal's height over there <laughs> that <laughs> That, that was interesting. Uh, so, hey, John, if somebody wanted to support us, how could they do that? 
Yeah, if you want to support us, there's a couple ways. You know, the easiest way is to like this podcast, especially if you do like what we're doing. And if you want to hear more, you're new here, you might subscribe. Uh, if you want to get a little more involved, you can go to our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy. Or we have a plethora of levels and rewards you can get if there's some other thing you'd like to see us do. Uh, let us know. We're probably going to be adding shirts soon. We're still kind of working the details out on that we're one. We're working details out on that. I, 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 we're arguing about what's going to be on the shirt. I want my ass on it, but yeah. apparently that's not uh, that's not going to happen. And what's going to be on the shirt? Logistics? Are we going to have them made and shipped out? Are we going to use some third-party service? There's all kinds of bits to this that we're probably overcomplicating, but we're we're working on that. We're gonna gonna get a bunch of uh, uh, slave labor from the Asia, from the Asian Peninsula to go through there, and uh, that's the only way to get good. Do shirts. it with markers. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And hey, it's uh, good enough for Nike. Absolutely. If uh, if there is one other thing you can do to support this show, if you want to send us beer. Uh, get in touch with us on our Facebook page. That's also where you can like and uh, check out some of what we do. It's a good way to get your name on the show a lot. Absolutely. And thank you, Bria, again. There's uh, this beer that we're finishing up. And then I think I'm in love with her. I just I want to throw that out there. She's, she, 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 she got us beer, and that, that, that's impressive. She's sitting at home like she just cringed a little bit when she heard that. <laughs> but then she was like, is he being playful or I, how I, serious is he? Now she's worried. I think, she's, yeah, it's kind of stalkerish. Yeah, yeah. yeah now uh, she's like thinking like, wait, was that a joke or not a joke? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 we just lost Bria. Just leave it hanging. Just yeah, leave just it hanging don't, right let, there. don't yeah. let her know if it was a joke. But uh, but yeah. Call, call me later, sugar. Yeah. If uh, if you want to get your if you want to get your name on the show, you can definitely send us beer, and, and we will uh, let you know uh, what we think of the beer. And thank you profusely because that's awesome. That is awesome. All right, so we've kind of gotten our way through this, uh, and, and and we've looked at the background. So the question that we're dealing with is: Does it really even matter who's president? So, John, what, what, what do you think after hearing all this? Do, does the president have the have the ability to make make big changes? You know, I'm I'm really torn on that, and and I'll, I'll tell you the reason why. I think if you look at all this stuff on paper, uh, the way it's written out in the Constitution, uh, then yeah, I mean, this is an incredibly important position. But if if you then take and look at the actual history of our government, the direction that we have gone, party by party, you know, uh, the pendulum swing and the the long term future of the country almost seems should I say predictable regardless of the president. I mean, yeah, if you were to put it on a on, you know, on a line graph, it would yeah. be, it, it, it would be pretty obvious what's going to happen. You'd have a couple of spikes and a couple of troughs, but uh, yeah. for the most part, it'd be pretty predictable. And 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 you know it it you know let's let's look at the worst president ever. Uh, uh, Johnson, right? I mean, when you agree, Andrew Johnson, Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, I think Lyndon Johnson should be, you know, dug up and dragged behind a car. But Andrew Johnson, to me, was was what's the worst president? Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Let's look at Andrew Johnson. Okay, if, uh, you know, I was, I was going to go uh, a different way, but uh, but fine. What did Andrew Johnson di- do as the worst president? that ruined this country, that had a long-lasting, horrible effect on this country. Reconstruction. Okay. Well, so that was largely Congress that did it, but uh, but but you, you know, uh, but but a lot of a lot of the 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 problems we have today are uh, you know, go back to our Sorry. our Reconstruction. I, I like it when you throw things at me. That's that's pretty. That's pretty oh, I hot. threw it at the table. When when oh, I throw on. something at you, you'll shout. You know, we don't have a video. We could have done, had a whole thing there about <laughs> you throwing shit at me, and you you had to ruin that, didn't you? Now she throws shit at me. Of course. So. Uh, yeah, but 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 I see your point. It, it, the long term effects of it are uh, you know are negligible because the, the the next president fixes it. We had an incapacitated president for a while. There was literally Wilson, yeah. a, a, a well and Roosevelt. Yeah, there was literally a a unconscious man. Yeah, yeah. Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, yeah, literally unconscious. His wife Edith ran the country for a few months. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can we just point out that a woman ran the country for like six months? Did a pretty and, good job. And it didn't go to shit. She did a pretty good job. That woman was not Hillary Clinton. Lady at the though. post office. Yeah, but but fucking lady <laughs> at the post office. <laughs> I'm not gonna make that joke because you will just go off on La- me. Lady yeah, at the post that's office. Not, you are you will let's like go left on me if I make that joke. <laughs> I, I I I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it again because I have to. You know, women are sixty, almost sixty percent of the electoral, and you still can't get a chick elected president. That 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 that, that tells because me something. Because it was Hillary fucking Clinton. Well, it didn't have to be. You could have picked anybody. 
Yeah. You're the majority. I'm you not even old enough to run yet. Okay. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, uh, what's her name? Debbie Schulter Weinerman. What, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Wasserman Schultz. God, please yeah. no. God, please. But I mean, you know, it, you know, I think it's funny. We're we're kind of going off on a tangent mm-hmm. here, but but she she admits she clearly fixed that primary. Yeah. And then the Supreme Court came through and said, I don't really see why she can't fix that primary. Now I'm I'm over some fine things. And, yeah. And yeah, it was possible for someone else to win, but. <laughs> You know, I, I I do have some sympathy that that th- there was a a party machine that was pushing someone through, and uh, you know we have the system kind of screwed up and and what it takes to uh, to uh, get someone on the ballot, and that's um that's kind of where we we landed with Hillary, and I don't think very many people were happy about it. I think most people that that voted for. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there is like this thing over here where where they're they're pouring they're pouring scotch in the background. They're, they're, it's important. They're, they're it's moving important. to scotch. I, I I gotta say, and like they are having this whole conversation about how much should be poured and how <laughs> how it should and how do you pour. I, there's a whole thing. Uh, so sorry if I was like sounding. Oh like my I was god! Droning. Yeah, it's a good scotch, isn't it? Oh my god! That's <laughs> good. I'm telling you, that's good stuff. That's a seven. Yeah. <laughs> Much better, oh, much better than that pill. On a three-point scale, right? <laughs> on a three-point scale, that is a seven. Yeah. Uh, so I guess if I was to be talking about this stuff, I would say that, that I think a president can have uh, – a charismatic president can have massive short-term effects. Yeah. But I don't know that, 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 that it really matters in the long term who the, who the president is because it seems that, that the, the minutia of bureaucracy uh, prevents that. Yeah, well, and, and I wanted to ask the opposite. We asked about the the, the worst president. You said Andrew Johnson. Um, so so let's ask about who was the best president. <sighs> Y'all aren't gonna like 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 my answers to this stuff. I don't. I don't. Go imagine. ahead and say Reagan. Uh, no, I'm gonna go Calvin Coolidge. Oh, Hell yeah, I'll, I'll take Coolidge. Yeah, Calvin Coolidge is my favorite president. Okay, but let me ask you. I, I think we're all Coolidge fans here. Uh, uh, cool Calvin, you know? Yeah. Um, Silent what, Cal. What did he do that just made this country great? You know? As little as Nothing. possible. As well, I understand. Little as possible. But did yeah. it matter? Yeah. Like, you know. Well, I think he slowed the growth. But, uh, it, I, and actually, I think that's where a president can be more effective is in being, uh, be, being, being, uh, less active than in being more active. I think a less active president can greatly affect things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, because we're looking at like all the things that a president can do, exec- executive orders, executive agreements, uh, impoundment, all of these things like can just be changed the next go around. Um, and, and I think like the inactivity, I think, like you said, kind of slows the growth. Um but even and, and, there, even there, the next the next they, guy comes they in. They can, and, and, you know. Yeah. But um, with all those other things, you're kind of looking at a growth here, maybe a, a little less there, you know. Um, and you can kind of go both ways with it. But by just not doing anything, you're just generally slowing shit down. Yeah, yeah, which is it, it, impressive. Yeah, it's something difficult to do with that machine. Uh, I didn't think y'all would be be jumping up there on Seriously? Calvin Coolidge. I really, I just, I thought we'd had that talk before. I don't know. Most people, most people are like Calvin Coolidge. He didn't do anything, and I'm like, yeah, they, yes. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Do you remember, like, we want the little government that I, doesn't I, do anything. I know it's just, it's, I, I'm not used <laughs> you don't to hearing it, yeah. anybody liking Calvin Coolidge. Yeah. As a, well, and and I was getting ready it, for you to say Reagan. I was like, just don't, just let him say what he wants. But, no, I, no, but, no. There, there's things I like about Reagan, but I think, uh, I, I think in the long run, he, he. Probably had a negative effect in the long run. Thank you. Well, and you know, I'm even fine with. Well, I'm fine with someone even saying like he was he was good, but I'm tired of an entire political wing riding his dick. Yeah. Get off it. You know. Well, yeah. To me, to me, have something else you know, notable that you can tout. To me, Reagan uh, was like Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. I think he was somebody that was necessary at the time and did a lot of great things for the time, but fucked us in the long run with, with out of control spending. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's part of what, you know, part of what makes you a memorable president is, uh, you, you know, 
catering to that time period. Yeah. And if we look down the Solving road, a big things change. Things yeah. change. Hey, I want to talk a little bit about some of these powers, uh, a little little bit off. Are there any of these powers that we talked about that you, you think the president shouldn't have? Any of these powers that we talked about that I think the yeah, the, 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 the power to deploy troops. You don't think the president should have that, that authority? Who should have that authority? No, no. I think the president should be able to deploy troops within our borders. And, and I say that to say they can send, and I'm not, I'm not saying like they should be able to, you know, Stick the army on the citizens? Right, right. No, I'm okay. saying, if like, to our border. Oh, oh, okay. Like, if somebody's okay. attacking us, they should be able to send troops I see to what our you're border. Saying. I would you're even right. give them, like, a, you know, I don't know, uh, 50 miles into the ocean. Yeah, I don't know. Some, some you know, reasonable standard there. But, but only to the border in Canada and Mexico. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly. Um, not even give them a mile in. They can go a mile, you know, <laughs> if, if the army's coming, you know, fine. But the, the point is, they should be, they should, they should be mostly about defense and in an emergency, yeah. and if they need to take people and send them halfway around the world, or even into another country, they should have to go to Congress. How about, how about if 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 North Korea sends a uh, a nuclear nuclear bomb over to us? They can't do that. But North Korea sends a nuclear bomb over to us. Can the president then hit that button and send a nuclear bomb back, or does he have to go to Congress and get a declaration of war? Listen, if we get hit with a nuke, I, I, I'll just assume that that the constitution burned at that time. I mean, you know, seriously, at, at some point you sit there and you say, send the nuke. I'll apologize later. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, you know. I was just yeah, curious. I think I was you curious. restrain the powers as much as you can. Um, because then when things get really drastic, somebody has got to make an active decision of this is literally that important that I'm willing to go to prison for doing this, this thing that I think is so right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's like a... Then, then you get, honestly, then you get Lincoln with habeas corpus. Suspending habeas corpus. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you're right. And, and that did happen, it right? It did happen. And, and we look back... And, and he got shot. Yeah, mm -hmm. we look back and we, we, we judge him for it. And maybe he was right, maybe he was wrong. But I think that, that shows my point, if anything. In a true emergency, people are going to act and face consequences later. Yeah. I mean, seriously, if a meteorite hit us and we weren't allowed to, to send aid to a certain part without Congress and, you know, Congress incapacitated, I don't, I think they're just going to fucking do it. I don't think yeah. anyone's going to sit there and say, wait, hold up. Unless it's in Puerto Rico. What? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, but but they, they may and, uh, go and, and talk to the president of the Virgin Islands or something like that and, and kind of work with them. <laughs> <laughs> Let Puerto Rico into into yeah. Its own treaties. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Do you hear about that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's crazy yeah. stuff. Crazy yeah. stuff. Oh lord. Good memes though. Yes. Terrible. Great terrible memes. Stuff. All right. Well, I think we have uh, kind of beaten this one down, haven't we? Yeah. Well, so did we answer the question? Of does it matter? Does it matter who's president? Like if if random if we use the lottery system to pick uh, the president, just, does it matter? Yeah, it matters. It matters. I think it matters in the short term. I don't. Yeah. I don't know that it matters in the long term. But again, I think the it matters in the short term. Think. Look, let's just do. Well, a little, let's just do a little hypothetical here, okay? And Trump isn't elected. Hillary Clinton is. Mm -hmm. What's different? I honestly don't know that answer. You've I mean, already I think, argued, what do you think would be different? You've I'll, already argued that Roosevelt and Reagan made a difference in the long term. I, I, that I did. screwed us in the long I did, term. I did. I did. Uh, and and, I, and I've, I've said earlier that I think in some cases it, it happens. But yeah. I think in the vast majority of cases, uh, the, the, the scope of government is not changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, I think if Hillary had been elected, we would have had a system. I think if anything, it would be more, more hawkish. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think it would have been more active and spent more money with Puerto Rico. Uh, I think it, you know, I, I really, I really do think it would have been a more active government. Yeah. Um, but you know, does that mean that that anything in the long scope would change? I don't think it did. I don't think it would have. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I guess I guess we get into a really interesting conversation of what really matters because I mean, yeah. whenever, whenever Trump was elected, and and I think it was purely speculative. I don't think there was any any meat behind it, but we saw the stock market rally. Hell, my uh, my portfolio right now, I'm 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 uh, sitting at twenty six percent gain year to date. Now you know that's probably gonna gonna eat up in the future. But sell now, yeah. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, uh, you know, um, we saw this big rally now. 
we we look at that and we're like, yeah, I made twenty six percent this year. But we all know that, that there's so much productivity in the world, and that, that that's going to balance out. You know, if we if we purchase a lot of cars this year, that means next year is probably not going to buy as many cars. You know, and so forth. And so we got to ask: Does short term stuff matter? Or does the fact that the the stock market's still going to average what is it, like seven percent, you know, gain over over decades? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, what does matter? Even what does it mean for it's nine over a decade? Is it nine anyway? It doesn't matter. <laughs> See, <laughs> I think but, it's the rule of nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the point is like. What does it mean? Does, does what happened today when the stock market rallied and, and we had these these crazy Twitter wars and, and the memes? All the, We lost the Joe memes. We got new memes. You know, Does that stuff the really matter? So the Joe memes were great. Uh, or does the really long-term nature of things matter? Yeah. I think the thing that Trump probably has the biggest ability to impact is our relationship with other nations um and from what i can see he's really negatively impacting a lot of those um and but then the question that i have to ask is i i think that's impacting us now but are they going to kind of give us a pass that this guy you know was just some fucking whack job oh of course they are or are they going to go, nah, you bitches elected a fucking whack job. We're not going to trust you. Well, you know, they, they, it, it is, it is very similar to what happened in 1980 when Reagan was elected. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, this cowboy is, is going to, going to screw things up. And, and mm -hmm. for four years, we thought he was, you know, he, he, he was very much a in their faith cowboy. Mm -hmm. But in the last four years, he, he, he built some of the greatest relationships we've ever had. Yeah. You know, he, he, he reached out and, and, you know, was able to, to make friends with the Soviet he and right. Gorbachev were close. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, great relation. The Pope, great relationships. He was able to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we have that. I, 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 I don't. I, I'm not going to gamble that we yeah, do because I'm not. I'm either. not a Trump fan. Yeah. But uh, I, uh, I, the comparisons are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and and, and I think I, I think over. I think in the short term it does matter. And and I, here's why I think it matters. His powers. His the president seems to follow the cabinet and I don't know what they tell him when he gets in there, <laughs> but like they say, I'm going to do all this. They get into office and they immediately come out and say, I didn't know. Now, I don't know what they know in there that, that they're <laughs> killing him. And he's like, well, fuck it. I'm doing what everyone has done for 50 years. Cause it's working so great, but maybe there's something that we don't know. I don't care. But what, what he does seem to affect he or she does seem to affect uh, election to election. He so far. He so far there was a there was a there was a close she this last one, um, but does seem to affect uh, uh, election to election. That's not the first time Hillary Clinton's been been referred to as a close she. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Well, there was a whole thing where Michelle was referred that way for a while, yeah. but that, that's a different thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, what what they do affect <laughs> year to year, and I even see this with the first lady mentioning Michelle, is the culture. I mean, if, if, you know, we're seeing the NFL thing, yeah. a lot of that is due to Trump, whether yeah, it's sure. directly or indirectly, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. the Black Lives Matter movement, yeah. uh, the, um, the, the divisive, uh, uh, nature of, or let's say not, let's not say, let's say this, the rise of the alt-right. Yeah. The, largely came out of, at, largely came out of the Obama administration, just as the Black Lives Matter did, and then gave, was given fuel in the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 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 uh, seeming cohesiveness of our own government, mm -hmm. uh, th how people perceive how well, how cooperative our government is. These cultural ideas are, are drug out by leadership. And, and I, I think this, the culture of our country is a lot more what the president gets to affect. And, you know, that that's kind of a, a, an implied power almost. Uh, um, but they really get to swing that year to year. I, and, and I would be really interested to see, I, I don't know the numbers on this, if there was correlation between, you know, charity giving and, and what the president was pushing and, and, and uh, feelings toward various diseases. You know, I know Michelle was pushing that whole school lunch thing. Uh, there w there's been various workout programs in the past that presidents yeah. and first ladies have pushed. And we've seen that kind of reflected in local 
every day affect your life, uh, actions, decisions, and politics. And Nancy Reagan's Just Say No program. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. You know, that was massive. Oh, yeah. It, it, look how that swung the drug war. I mean, you want to talk yeah. about, about a long-lasting effect on this country. I mean, how many people... Lies and bullshit. Mm, anyway, spread to our fucking children as if they weren't people who deserve fucking respect. Just say no, kids. I mean, yeah, don't do drugs. <laughs> but don't do it because Nancy Reagan's a bitch. Well, okay. kind of like Nancy. Okay. I, I, I think the mistress has opinions on that one, too. I think but so. But anyway, I, just think, I think that's... Is bullshit. I think that's where the president has the most power. And, and I don't think it's... I, you know, the scary thing about it to me is that is not the power anyone is talking about when no. they're electing a president. Yeah. They're talking about all the other shit that nobody changes. Nobody can control. Yeah. No, Nobody's pulling us out of wars. Nobody's uh, 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 not impounding. It's not your power. Uh, what, what's impound it called? Impound the funds. Yeah. Impound, no, nobody's, impound, nobody's doing all that. Nobody's doing enough pardons to really matter. Nobody's doing that shit. And the thing that they are doing, everybody's ignoring. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. You know. I think you're right. So does the office of president not matter because um, because of societal amnesia, uh, well, short-term that, memory loss? I don't even think it's that. I think it's a, it, that there's a societal norm that, 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 that brings us back. We are inherently moderate, mm -hmm. and everything brings us back to that moderate middle. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have these swings, but we keep coming back to this moderate middle. Uh, you know, we had the populist period where, where, you know, government grew dramatically, but it was very quickly fixed by a, by a conservative movement. You know, mm -hmm. then we had we had the uh, uh, FDR and the New Deal, and then it was very quickly fixed by uh, you know Nixon and Reagan and, and and these these different ideas. But was it fixed? Because the size and scope of government has only grown. Well, it has, but it but it's it's gone down in other ways. You know, it's 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 gone down in social affairs a, a lot of times for for different periods of time. Uh, there there are other places where it's grown dramatically, where it's grown the most is in the military. So uh, you, you start seeing these things, and, and and we tend to we tend to come back to the middle. Now we don't we don't ever get our spending under control. No, but we tend when we swing well left. We then have this massive swing back to the right. Yeah, you know, you know, it, it's funny. You know, a couple things said here reminded me of a of a story I've heard. You know, working in politics a few times, um, that uh, that that really <laughs> resonates with me. Uh, but you know, a, a, a new president, you can call it president, senator, what, whatever you want to call it, is coming into power, and uh, their predecessor, you know, shakes their hand and you know wishes them a a, a, a happy term and hands them two envelopes, says. Read one of these now, as soon as I leave, and read the other one at the start of your second term. He takes it and takes it back to his room, and he takes the one for the second term, and he puts it on his desk, and he takes the first one, he opens it. And he reads the letter, and it says, blame me for everything. Okay, and he folds it up, and he, he goes to his first term, he blames the last guy for everything, and then, you know, he, he gets left to a second term, of course, right? And then he goes to the, you know, he, he sits down after his election, he opens a letter and, and he reads it and it says, now write a letter. Yeah. Okay. yeah you know, okay. write two letters, you know, but yeah. 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 I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. So, um, the only other question that I kind of wanted to talk about was these smaller parties that haven't had a turn at, uh, at having their president in office, can they make a difference? I think they make, your your smaller parties are your only experimenters in politics. Yeah, and we've seen time and again that 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 your smaller parties are are where changes are made. Mm -hmm. Now they're made largely by uh, getting some momentum and having the larger parties co opt the ideas. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, you know we, we wouldn't have nominating conventions w without them. We wouldn't yeah. have. Uh, we wouldn't have our, our current currency system if we didn't have that. Uh, that might not be a good thing, mm -hmm. but we we wouldn't have it. Uh, the idea of the United Nations began as a, a, a third party idea. Yeah. A lot of these things that, that 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 were out there, we just wouldn't have without them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and my thought here is, and and being most familiar with the Libertarian Party, um, so first of all, I think there would be a certain element of they're going to make a bunch of big promises get into office and then realize they can't actually fulfill most of the promises that they're making. Um, but I look at it and I think that a libertarian president would impound funds for lots and lots of shit. 
um, would uh, reverse a bunch of um, executive orders. And probably the thing that I think would have, if they were able to make a long-term difference, probably the thing that I think they would be able to have the most impact on is pardoning people convicted of victimless crimes. Um, vetoes, I think they would have. Oh, and vetoes, yeah. It's got to be a federal crime, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah, It does have to be a federal crime. Um, But I think that if we're looking at um, people convicted over... uh, You mean they can't pardon uh, traffic tickets? They can't pardon traffic tickets. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That would be nice, um, but I th- although I bet if the president called in your in, you know in your behalf, it would work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Um, but the I think judge just goes that's gangster. Probably where they would have the most ability to impact long term, um, <laughs> because I think that it would get a lot of attention, and I think with enough people. Like there's there's already kind of some momentum in this idea that victimless yeah, crimes are bullshit. I don't know how how libertarian the impoundment of funds idea is. I uh, I like the idea, but mm-hmm. you're you know you you've got something that's that's been that's been put in place yeah. by a legislative body, and then the executive says, "Well, I'm not paying." Well, what you pay for. It. I think it depends on which version of libertarian you're looking at, because I think if it's if you've got an aggressive libertarian in office, then their idea is shrink government as much as possible. Um, and so if that means impounding funds, that's what it means. Well, and again, then I think you have the constitutional libertarians who say, well, this was passed, you know, through the Constitution, of course, impoundment. It's in also that, in the Constitution, but. I'm in that rough spot where yeah. I would be cheering for them to do it. Yeah. And at the same time going, going, but it really isn't, isn't right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, yeah. well, and they're both in the Constitution. So, yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you look at it and you go, yeah. I would be cheering them the whole way and the, and the whole time be scared to death of, of, of the president. Of what itself. happens next. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so. Well, if we just made them the dictator, this. Well, scotch is so good. It's a yeah. really good scotch. And so. Briefly, I just want to look at the next largest minor political party and look at the Green Party, and would they be able to <laughs> affect change? Um, because I think going the other way, they would have a lot more trouble. The Green Party, huh? Yeah. How many? Uh, we're, we're playing how, in imaginary how, how many, land. How many states Mike. are they on the ballot on? Not, not enough, as many as us. I, I, not, not enough. I was, to, I was just curious. Not enough to mathematically win if they got every one of them. <laughs> like I said, we're playing in imaginary land. Um, I, I think the same thing would be true of them in, in, in your imaginary world as would be true of the libertarians. Yeah. You know, uh, I think any third party w- would have would have extreme difficulties because they would have to use the power of the executive uh, uh, incredibly aggressively because yeah. they wouldn't have the, the have the Congress. Yeah, yeah. So, well, so and that's I, that's where I think uh, that um, they may be more willing to use the power of the of, of the yeah, executive more aggressively. I, yeah, I, I think you're being a little unfair here in, in, in your kind of analysis to say that they would go the that's, other way and have a lot of trouble. Um, well, I think that's because. Go ahead. Because uh, you know, first of all, you, you you talked largely about the pardoning, but a lot of the things that we talk about pardoning for in our party, they largely agree with. So I think I think we would have some similarities there. Uh, as far as the impoundment of funds, I think there's just as much things they want to impound funds for. They're different things. I think they'd be more aggressive with it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that they would love to impound funds on any subsidy on on banks or or oil uh, or oil usage. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Money you, going to automotive companies. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think. I think they love to impound all those funds. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. You, you. You talk about uh, veto. There's a ton of stuff they would love to veto. Now it's not necessarily the same stuff we'd love to veto. Mm-hmm. Um, now would they be able to push their environmental legislation through? Probably not. Yeah. You know, but- well, and I guess that's kind of where I'm looking at it is from their their main pillar and their right. main goal versus our main goal. Yeah. Um, and I think that their main goal requires a lot more legislative effort than ours would. Probably. And so probably. I think they would, they wouldn't benefit, their main goal wouldn't benefit as much from strictly having the executive office as right. ours I, would. I, I think, I think a libertarian candidate would have a broader scope of being able to build a coalition 
uh, because because there, there's positions on both in both parties that, that, yeah. that would support it. It's a lot harder to build a coalition, I think, for a for a Green Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because they're not going to reach reach across the Republican side no. almost yeah. at all. Well, and and they even are largely only um, appealing to a very left side of the democrats yeah 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 so a lot of a lot of your bernie supporters were yeah green yeah, floaters went to green. call them yeah, yeah. They, they flip back and forth so but anyway um that i i just kind of wanted to kind of take a look at that and, and see what we thought but other than that i think we have largely kind of covered this topic so let us know guys what you think um we know that during campaign season it gets really heated and everybody acts like it really does matter but now that we're kind of in between, what do you guys think? Does it actually matter who the fuck we put in the presidency? Could we put a dog in and it'd be just fine? I actually think it'd a probably be better. Get done, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Government would, would not grow as fast. Can we elect a dog named Calvin? That'd be the best. Kind of like your dog. We should, we should, your dog should be Whistle. Yes. Whistle for president. Whistle for president. <laughs> She's coming over. She heard oh, her name. Oh, no. Okay. Hi, Whistle. Um, but anyway, uh, let us know what you guys think. You can find our show on um, any of the podcast platforms, also on our social media by searching Six Pack Philosophy. And you can go to our website at sixpackphilosophy.com if you really want to. Um, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, support in whatever way that you possibly can. We really appreciate it. Um, share this show with your friends and your enemies and your everywhere in betweens. Um, love you guys. Hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next week. Bye. Cheers. 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 There it is. <laughs> Six pack philosophy can be used to treat closed mindedness, straight ticket voting, and faulty reasoning. Side effects of six pack philosophy may include questioning the status quo, thinking for oneself, and electile dysfunction. Ask your bartender if six pack philosophy is right for you. And as always, keep on drinking and thinking. This has been Six Pack Philosophy.